welcome back to Loki's Librarian. If you are new here, welcome. I am your librarian, Katrina, and on Sundays I do a thing called Books and Booze, where I review a book and mix up a cocktail. This month we're going to take a look at some alternate systems of government, because Election Day is in two days? Oh no, I forgot to roll my calendar. Two days is, is the official Election Day. I mean, early voting's going on. But let's see how else we could be ruled, you know, if we... If we're smart enough to get rid of our politicians. Um, this week's book is Chaos Theory by Robert P. Murphy. The accompanying cocktail is a chaos cocktail. It is two ounces of whiskey, two ounces of pineapple juice, one ounce of cranberry juice, and one ounce of club soda. So let's do this. This is a very short book. It's it's less than a hundred less than a hundred pages. I think the, the, like the total text was sixty seven, and then it's got you know like ten pages of references and citations, which I appreciate. It allowed me to add to my wish list exponentially. Some of the books I already have, though, so that made me very happy. Um, I'm not going to lie. I kind of picked all short books this month on on purpose. Wow, that's an interesting typo on person. On per best. Since I have uh, Reagan at the end of the month, still doing the president's books, Reagan is going to be a doozy. I feel like Reagan might be another 800-page book. So I picked short books on purpose so that I can get myself a head start on Reagan because with the holidays coming up, time's going to be at a premium. Reagan's going to require extra brain power. No pun intended. The man did, you know, die of Alzheimer's. So I'm not trying to be punny or mean. I'm just saying extra is going to be required. Uh, this book is basically just two essays discussing the benefits of anarcho-capitalism, which is wildly appealing to me since I am basically an anarcho-capitalist. I mean... No joke, I took one of those those like political quizzes that helps you determine your political alliances. And I came out at the very peak of, an, of an anarcho-capitalist society. I'm like at the very tippy top of the pyramid of such thought. I was like, yeah, that, uh, that tracks. Sure thing. All right, so this book was basically an addendum to Murray Rothbard's For a New Liberty, the Libertarian Manifesto that I read back in May of this year. But Murphy expands on a couple niche ideas from Rothbard's work, and in an interesting way, addressing specifically private law in Essay 1 and private defense in Essay 2. Oh, no. There we go. Phew, I was like, crap, I'm not going to be able to get this thing open. It's just one ounce of cranberry, one ounce of cranberry. I feel like this is not quite going to fit in a rocks glass. I mean, I have the rocks glass, but I don't know. It seems like a lot of liquid to go into a rocks glass. This is shaking. Hang on. Yeah. Short shake because my hands are cold. So private law, Murphy points out, quote, a free society is one in which property rights are generally respected. Uh, the existence of a state, an institution that uses force to place itself above property rights, thus precludes freedom as we shall use the term. Oh, what am I doing? Let's go straight into there. I'm right. There's no way. I'm going to go with that and go ahead and top it with the club, with the one ounce of club soda. And then I'll top it off with another ounce of club soda as I pour cocktail in there. One ounce. This falls very much in line with the screeching libertarian battle cry, taxation is theft, which is true. I mean, government has so little respect for private property that they're stealing money directly from your paycheck every payday. So how do we get around the problem of government stealing everything not nailed down and sometimes things that are nailed down, they just rip the nails out and treating a lot of us like lifelong indentured servants, you know, killing our pets for shits and giggles. Oh, I like that. Oh, that's delightful. Um, contract law. Uh, now I know. How the hell do you enforce law without government? Well, that, that's kind of covered in there, all right? I mean, there's there's binding arbitration, which people are familiar with, right? There, there's mediators, there's, um, well, lawyers, <laughs> but, but you come up with independent firms that are trusted, respected, have built their own brands and, uh, for reliability and honesty and making fair judgments. And the cream rises to the top, basically. And I mean, everything is handled via contract law. And then trusted mediators determine if the contract has been breached, and if yes, then insurance adjusters pay out. Now, at first I'm very skeptical reading this, because generally insurance companies are sleazy. They don't have a good reputation. You know, I mean, insurance companies now are notorious for finding any reason not to pay out and for denying valid claims. But then again... Insurance companies, as they now stand, are operated virtually without competition <clears throat> and entirely with the government's blessing. Keep forgetting to turn this. You can see I'm, you know, drinking with the libertarian poster child right now. 
It's never too early to learn that the government is a greedy piglet that suckles on a taxpayer's teat until they have sore, chapped nipples. I mean, hell, the government props them up and encourages them to be badly run because insurance companies spend massive money on their preferred political critters. You know, they use lobbyists to do this. Guess what industry would probably... Well, yeah, I'm actually pretty sure this would entirely vanish if we had no government. Lobbying. Lobbying should not be a thing. But it is. Our government allows it. But without the need for absurd laws controlling every facet of our lives, there would be no need for someone to lobby government to get those laws passed. So basic contract law, open market insurance companies, which would help keep prices low because insurance agencies would have to compete for your money. Specialized firms would provide standardized forms, right? Basic boilerplate contract. And Murphy goes into great detail on how this could work up to and including murder, like no joke, right? He has a section on how murder would happen. I mean, truly, there's, there, there are some people who just refuse to play nice with others. He even addresses, I think that was actually my concern when I was reading Murray Rothbard's book, was what about the people who refuse to play nice with others? Well, he includes a section on that, so apparently I'm not the only one who saw that flaw. I mean, if you've ever seen Legally Blonde or any episode of Law and Order, you would know the difference between malum in se and malum prohibitum, right? Prohibitum just means it's illegal because the government says it's illegal, like speeding, all right? Malum in se means it's wrong because you are infringing directly on somebody else's rights, like murder, theft, rape. So contracts include clauses such as, quote, if I am found guilty of murder, I agree to pay Y million dollars to the estate of the deceased, end quote. Now, as he points out, no one is going to sign such a document unless there's a strong presumption of innocence, right? I'm not going to sign something agreeing to just blanket pay this out unless I'm reasonably certain that if I am in fact innocent, I can be found innocent. However, procedures have to cover the ability to catch and convict the actual guilty party. So there would be no untested DNA samples anywhere. You know, firms would actually be running those things to see if we could find matches and garner the guilty party. If you engage in criminal activity, even if it's not murder, Let's say you decide to, to be a thief and you get caught and found guilty and you're basically broke or you've hidden the proceeds from your theft, but you've kept your insurance premiums up. So your insurance company will pay out the agreed upon amount for having been caught for theft. Then they're going to drop you as a client because eventually you're going to become completely uninsurable. Nobody wants to keep paying out a high risk client and unemployable because no one's going to want to hire somebody who can't get basic insurance for lack, not for lack of money, right? but because the insurance companies have determined you are a bad risk. I saw a very similar argument. I, it was either fee.org or Cato. I'm, I'm going to try and find it again and throw up, a, you know, th throw up a headline and a link here somewhere on how we could easily get rid of bad cops by making them carry personal insurance that pays out if they're found guilty of you know, abuse of power, violence, all those things that qualified immunity protect them from if we make them carry personal insurance and that insurance because insurance companies are very good at determining risk that's why they have clauses for things like pre-existing conditions well you're more risky if you have a pre-existing condition like obesity alcoholism smoking well i don't smoke but still those things make you a higher risk and so that's why insurance companies watch for those things when granting contracts and then use any reason they can to not pay out but you know that's that's something else entirely and um going back to the cop example if a cop becomes uninsurable because insurance company has determined he's a bad risk for whatever reason then he or she loses their job because they're uninsurable nifty right i kind of like this idea i've liked this idea since i first heard of it a couple of years ago but what about the incorrigibles the ones that just don't play nice i mean during my review of rothbard's book that's i said that there will always be those who refuse to play nice with others well, Murphy has an answer for them, too. And, I mean, fuck me if I don't adore market anarchists. I mean, he found a way to make serial killers profitable. And I don't mean a, in a let's sell their artwork from prison and tell my story in a tell-all biography sort of profitable. I mean, how and why insurance companies would be willing to keep insurance contracts with serial killers. And if a killer is found guilty of said crimes, then the insurance agency would deal with the killer if the killer agreed to live in a secure building under close security or close scrutiny. And that's what the author said. The killer agrees to live in security. Now, that one I found a bit of a stretch because 
based on the way he worded it. Because why would a serial killer or, you know, any murderer, even if it's just a, you know, crime of passion sort of thing, agree to such a restriction? I mean, I would counter that part of the risk the insurance company takes would be that in addition to having to pay out to the estate of the deceased, they would become liable for ensuring the killer remained in a secure facility or face additional payout. Now, his point was uh, abuse in prison is very real, and, and it is, right? There's uh, Unarguably, there are bad prisons, there are bad prison guards, there are prisons where people are raped daily, and no, nobody deserves that. So his point was if the inmate's not happy, they can ag- arrange to move to a different location, and okay, I'm not necessarily in disagreement with that, but I also don't know that they would just agree to stay locked up. So I, th- I think that, ne- that that was a little bit nebulous for me. I'm not sure that, that I could quite wrap my head around it because I mean, it's not like killers are known for obeying the law. Why would they just agree to stay in prison? For those who would argue that under this system, insurance agencies become the state, Murphy says no, because insurance agencies would not have the power to tax or monopolize any service. Right? They can't. Right? Monopolies wouldn't necessarily exist. Now, monopolies, okay, that's not fair. Monopolies probably would exist because in all market societies, the cream rises to the top. Those who provide the best services tend to get the market share. They, they get the lion's share of things. Sometimes it's from being early, early adapters. Early adapters can absolutely make, you be, you know, right, make a company rise to the top. The point is that they wouldn't be able to just, well, all right. Now that I'm thinking about thinking about a couple of other flaws, like what would keep what would prevent a monopoly? What would keep, say, State Farm from rising to the absolute top and buying out all of their competitors so we only have one insurance company? All right, I, I mean, okay, people could, an insurance company like Allstate could refuse to sell. Certainly they could refuse to sell, but then what? You know, it becomes, we, we end up, well, I see the potential of this, but I also see how we could definitely fall into a cyberpunk dystopia as a result of this. I'm fine either way. I'm good with dystopia. I just, you know, I, I'm not, I feel like there's a lot of good ideas here, but it's not necessarily a fully fleshed out idea. Now, the other part that had me not quite convinced was his argument on children, because kids are innocent and kids should be protected like our pets. And he makes some good points about marriage contracts, including protection of kids from abuse in the marriage. And he allows for possibility of a baby market, quote unquote, in which children unwanted by parents or family could be sold. Now, this would no doubt be more effective than our current foster care and adoptive systems. But what about the highest bidder possibly being a pedophile? It's not addressed. It's not addressed in his book that, again, there are creepy fuckers out there who refuse to play nice with society. A lot of them are currently being feted by, you know, as media darlings. So this area brushes up against a tiny part of me believes that maybe government isn't all bad and maybe a minarchy is the way to go. Minarchy is basically a belief in an extremely limited government because children are not able to enter into contracts for their own safety. And if you sign a sales contract for your kid to somebody else, even if that contract includes a retraction clause, if you find out about abuse, how exactly are you going to know? I mean, so, so protecting kids hit my brick wall of faith in anarcho-capitalism. I, 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 that wasn't addressed, right? Murder, yes, fine. I, I'm fine with the way he addressed that. But didn't address pedophiles and how he would keep children who were sold to a pedophile under his baby market safe. That one threw me. I should reach out to him and say, hey, I read your book. How would this be handled by contract law? See if I can get a response. Um, Okay, on to his second essay, which I'm not going to go as long into this one. I I mean, it was fully half of the book, but the first part was way more interesting to me. I don't know. On the second essay, which is basically about defense, actually it's entirely about defense, because most people see standing armies as the only possible defense, and armies are pretty solely the province of governments. Well... Insurance companies would have good reason to keep invading armies from invading because wars are expensive. And if an army invades, the insurance company is going to have to pay out all those damages. If you remember from Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson, the broken glass fallacy is a fallacy, right? It's the, we're looking at the wrong way. No one actually benefits from war except the military industrial complex, which is something that's been well known for 
60 years, 70 years at this point, 70 years, because Eisenhower warned against it in his final speech, his final State of the Union address before stepping down. Eisenhower warned about the military-industrial complex. I'm not going to finish this before this is done because I'm almost done with the review. And he goes into detail on how this would work, why it would work, and, and I actually do believe this, like, intensely. Um, I, I believe he is absolutely correct in why and how insurance companies would be the best defenders because they're defending their bottom line, basically. He goes into detail on how this work and how insurance against war would be fairly inexpensive for us mere commoners because if we buy like individual insurance for our property against, you know, war, invasion, destruction like that, larger corporations have even more reason to not want a military invasion. Expensive. Wars are expensive. But th basically this entire section can be summed up with a very solid libertarian truism. When goods cross borders, armor, armies don't. Right? You don't fight with your trade partners. Nobody benefits from fighting with your trade partners. And that's it for this week. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you guys next Sunday. Bye.